All right, let's continue. We're now in verse 15 of chapter 21. And the one who spoke with me, so that is the angel, one of the angels uh, uh, that had the seven bowls, had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with this rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Okay, now we know now where so many of the pearly gates and the golden streets come from, but let's break this down. The city lies four square. Its length is the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, and it's 12,000 stadia, okay? And length, width, and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also angel, angel's measurement. Okay, so what are stadia and what are cubits? I think we kind of remember cubits, but we'll take it in order. Uh, because hopefully, with these explanations, you'll remember a stadia, or 12,000 stadia, first of all, it's about 1,375 miles. But a stadia is a transliteration. So it's not a translation. It's a transliteration of the Greek word stadion. Stadion. Stadia is stadion. What's stadion? A stadium. And that's the Greek measure of length. And by implication, a Greek stadium was a race course. All right, and so it's length, width, and height are equal. Well, now we're talking of cube 1,375 statute miles. Don't want to complicate things with statute or nautical. Now compare 1,375 miles high to the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. It's only five and a half miles. So Mount Everest would look very small, tiny, minuscule. This is also the, an interesting point is that this city accomplishes what the Tower of Babel was never able to achieve. Remember Gen Genesis 11, verse 1 and 4, now the whole earth had one language, which may be the case now, and the same words. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So you ever wonder why the Tower of Babel occurred and why it's recorded in, his, in uh, Scripture? Well, I think you know a little more to the story. Now, the thickness is 144 cubits. That's a 216 feet or 144 times 1.5. Remember what a cubit is? It's from the elbow to the tip of the finger. 18 inches is roughly a cubit. And so uh, the interesting here thing here is, though, is John makes a point and says, well, that's also an angel's measurement. So that tells us that an average angel from his elbow to fingers is also, but the same as an average man. Something to think of. So... Okay, what does 1,375 miles look like? Okay, first of all, we'll look at it from a U.S. perspective. And uh, one perspective I have is how many of you have ever driven through uh, throughout Texas on I-10? It goes on and on and on. In fact, if, if you can drive it in one day, you're, you're crazy. 
But normally it takes two days just to drive that one highway in one state. Well, this is what it looks like overlaid on the United States. Now remember, this is 1,375 miles of long, wide, and high. It's got to be massive and exciting. Okay, overlaid on top of the uh, Middle East. Um, this is kind of a dated map because we've got the Soviet Union, but uh, this would kind of give you an idea of how that would fit uh, with Israel in this very center. So let's move on because uh, uh, it says here that not only will the New Jerusalem replace the temple, but it's also cubed like the temple's most holy place. The most holy place was a cube. Uh, Revelation 21, 22, where it talks about uh, John seeing no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. So we're getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves, but, but we need to make that point because the inner sanctuary of Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 6, 19, uh, he, he, Solomon, prepared the innermost part of the house and to set there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. So, do you think this is kind of a coincidence uh, that uh, the New Jerusalem might be a humongous copy of the Most Holy Place? Oh, that's right. The Most Holy Place is where God inhabits. The New Jerusalem is where God inhabits. There are no coincidences in the Bible. Verse 18, the wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold like clear glass. Okay, we've already talked about jasper and uh, what it is and... and uh, uh, ancient Greek, uh, but uh, jasper as well as pure gold like clear glass. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen pure gold like pure gla like clear glass. But it, nevertheless, it would once again, it would radiate and reflect the glory, the glory of our almighty God. Verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. And the first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Now, I probably spent an hour on this slide and the next, so let me explain what I did here. Um, first and foremost, the foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every kind of jewel. Well, every kind of jewel is actually 12 being listed, to be exact. And, and most theologians believe that this is fashioned after Aaron's the high priest's breastplate of judgment. Remember, it had four rows of gemstones. And in Exodus 28, verse 15, we read, You shall make a breastpiece of judgment and skilled work. In the style of the ephod, you shall make it. So it goes over the chest of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, and you sh shall you make it. You shall set in four rows the stones. A row of sardis, topaz, carbuncle shall be the first row, second row, emerald, sapphire, and diamond, the third row, jacinth, ath agate, amethyst, and the fourth row, a barrel, onyx, and jasper. For there shall be 12 stones with the names according to the names of the sons of Israel. And they shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. So what you see uh, bolded in black, those are the common stones where Revelation agrees with Exodus or the Greek agrees with Hebrew to be more precise. The ones in blue are the Greeks, uh, stones that do not match the Hebrew uh, words that are in purple in Exodus. So 
Okay, do not match, really? Well, let's say the translation doesn't match. But do they really not match? Remember what I said earlier? In ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek, trying to determine what they call a gemstone is extremely difficult. So let's look at the words. In Revelation, we got carnelian. Okay, the Greek word is sardion. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means a, a reddish precious stone. Okay, yeah, a reddish precious stone, whatever that is. Uh, okay, well, in Exodus, we have what's called a sardius, or in Hebrew, a dim. And what does that word mean? Mm, flush, turn rosy, be dyed, or be made red, ruddy. So we got a reddish precious stone, and to be dyed and made ready. That seems to match, because... Sardius, in the context, is definitely a gemstone. Okay, how about chrysoprase and carbuncle? Chrysoprase comes from chrysopressos. It's uh, the translation definition in, in the Greek dictionary is a species of gem, okay, of a golden green color, okay, like that of a leek, okay? I hope you got a clear picture there. Okay, well, we have in Hebrew the carbuncle. Well, what's the carbuncle? Well, in Hebrew, it's berekit. Well, it's a gem, okay? A green stone, okay? Exact identification? Uncertain. Ah, okay, so we got a golden green color species of a gem in Greek. And a green stone, exact identification uncertain in Exodus, that's a match. How about chrysolite? Chrysolite is a name, and I love solving these contradictions in the Bible because the deeper you dig into the contradiction, the more you realize it's not a contradiction. Okay, chrysolite. Chrysolite uh, comes from the Greek word chrysolithos. It's a name applied by the ancients to all gems of a gold color. Oh, okay. Uh, and then they spec specify that, well, it's the modern day topaz. Okay, maybe yes, maybe no, all right? Because it's applied by the ancients to all gems of a gold color. Well, what's the match? Well, diamond, well, uh, diamond, well, we know what a diamond looks like. That's, no, that doesn't quite sound right. Well, look at the Hebrew word. Yehalom. What does Yehalom mean? A precious stone. Exact identification, uncertain. I'll call that a match. Okay? So, let's move on. Maybe a little trivial, but sometimes it's worth digging, going down these rabbit holes. Verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So um, is this, obviously this is where we get the pearly gates from. But is this literal? Are these really gigantic pearls? And you got some commentators going, yes, it is. And we have angels down the sea that were um, breeding um, oysters or whatever to these massive big pearls. Okay, can you give me chapter and verse? No. So, the question is, is it literal or is it figurative? Well, let's put this in context. Remember, John is trying to describe the indescribable and what he sees in terms of what his audience will be able to possibly understand um, in using, um, using objects that they can relate to and Greek words that they can relate to. Okay, so he sees these 12 massive gates and he says, it's like 12 pearls. And I'll just leave it there. Let's go on to verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. Okay, 
So the temple which houses the throne of God will be the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem houses the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. From the prophet Jeremiah 3.16, when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land, in those days, declares Yahweh, the Lord, they shall no more say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Remember, that's what the temple house. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or even missed. It shall not be made again. At that time, which we're reading about here in Revelation 21, 21, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord Yahweh. And all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. So instead of just the Jewish nation coming to the temple of the God, all nations shall gather to it. Wow. This has God's eternal kingdom written all over it. So let's read on. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Well, we got multiple prophecies here, too, being fulfilled. As prophesied by Isaiah 60, verse 19, the sun shall be no more. Your light by day, okay, yeah, let me rephrase that. The sun shall be no more your light by day. Does that say the sun has ceased to exist? Not really, but the sun shall no more be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But Yahweh, the Lord, will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for Yahweh, the Lord, will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. From the prophet Ezekiel in 43 verse 2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters. And the earth, the earth shone with his glory. Uh, so just as the Lord had filled uh, the most holy place, which remember is a cube with his glory, the Shekinah glory of God, so shall he, as well as the Lamb, fill the new Jerusalem, this new cube, with his glory. In Ezekiel, back to chapter 43, verse 5, two verses later, three verses later, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the temple. So that's a foreshadow of something that's going to be much, much more magnificent with the new Jerusalem. Verse 24, by its light will the nations, the nations, remember the Greek word for nations. You know, you got kingdoms and you got nations. Well, nations is ethnos. Kingdoms were more like geographical states. But here the light will, by its light will the nations, the ethnos, the ethnic groups walk and the kings of the earth, there's your kingdoms. There will be kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, it being Jerusalem, and its gates will never be shut by day. Well, for starters, um, gates are shut at night, and there is no night, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it, they, these kings from the nations, will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, their worship, their highest praise, uh, the sacrifice of praise, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, so the nations, the kings of the earth, um, there will be redeemed people groups and kings from all over the world coming 
to Jerusalem. Well, where do we get these people, groups, and kings? Well, remember in Revelation chapter 7, verse uh, and where, where uh, you have all these people that could not even be counted. There were so many standing before the throne of God. And one of the 24 elders says they came up from the great tribulation. Uh, verse 9, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on, to the, on the throne and to the Lamb to both the Father and the Son. And they will bring into it, Jerusalem, the glory and honor of the nations. They come as nations, worshiping God, giving him the glory and honor and praise. Foretold by the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 3, and many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. It's going to be a glorious, glorious sight. Okay, uh, verse 24 and verse 25. Okay, well, I'm going to break these verses with some I Isaiah uh, prophecies. Verse 24, by its light will the nations, the ethnos walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And Isaiah prophesied in chapter 60, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now that tells me that the sun is still out there, but they will gravitate. They will, they, they know where Jerusalem is in New Jerusalem because it'll come to your light and then you shall see and be radiant your heart shall thrill and exult remember the word exult it's it's about as emotionally uh, rejoiceful as we can put it into words because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. Now here the sea would be representative of the sea of Gentiles. Shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. And Revelation 21, 25, and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, the ethnos. Uh, Isaiah goes on in chapter 60 verse 11 your gates shall be open continually day and night they shall not be shut that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings their kings are not back home with their kings led in procession it's going to be an amazing, amazing sight. Verse 27, kind of a, a summary of the obvious, but, uh, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, why is this? Because everything unclean has been wiped out, been thrown into the lake of fire. Let's go back to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. And that takes us to the end of chapter 21. But just because the chapter end doesn't mean the narrative end. Remember, chapters and verses are not part of what was written and distributed. So let's read on because we got five more verses to read. Chapter 22, verse 1. <clears throat> then the angel showed me, so we got a continuation, showed me the river of the water of life 
bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. So let's break this down. Uh, first and foremost, this passage, these five verses, seem to be restoring most of, uh, to be uh, restoring most to as it was in the very beginning. That being God creating the Garden of Eden. Okay, and we go back to Genesis, uh, where it says, The Lord God, Yahweh God, made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life. Okay, so we're being plural. Um, what I don't think we're going to see is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I think that test has come and gone and has proven man incapable. Verse 10, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. Chapter 3, verse 22, And the Lord Yahweh God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Well, because we've taken on the knowledge of good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand, though, and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And that is what's being presented to mankind in this passage. So with that said, let's go to verse one. Because the angel showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal. Oh, I love clear running streams. Oh, it's just so magnificent. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So Let's go back to scriptural references in Ezekiel chapter 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple. Okay, well, um, is this really um, talking about uh, uh, the eternal kingdom? Because I thought there was no, um, no temple here. Yes, that's very true. Revelation 21, 22 explained to us that the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Okay, and this is throwing, flowing from what? The throne of God. So, there's no contradiction. With a measuring line in his hand, and this is, a, this is one of those strange uh, prophecies in Ezekiel that it's been so hard to try to understand. The measuring line in the hand, the man measured off a thousand cubits. Well, we know what a thousand cubits is, right? 1,500 feet. And was ankle deep. And again, he measured a thousand. And it was knee deep. And again, he measured a thousand. It was waist deep. And again, he measured a thousand. And it was what? It was deep enough to swim. And then, of course, he took them back on the bank. And on the bank of the river, very many trees on the one side and on the other side, on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. The prophet Zechariah said, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea, we got to see again and half it to the west of the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter. Jesus said in John 4, verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never for thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to 
eternal life. Yes. Let's read on verse 2. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Uh, this leaves the tree. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Okay, the prophet Ezekiel continues in chapter 47, verse 12. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their sanctuary is from the presence of God. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves, just like it says here in Revelation, for healing, for healing of the nations. And now that would be God's elect, his believers who were resurrected or raptured. Uh, going back to chapter 7, which is a very important interlude chapter in the book of Revelation, where John says, After this I look and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes and people, all languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb. And these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Let's read on verse 3. For no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. It is. Uh, the NIV adds the words, the city. And his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and the name, his name, will be on their foreheads. So the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, in the holy city. Uh, this, such as the same as verse 1, two verses in front, shows that both Yahweh and Yeshua, God the Father, God the Son, God the Messiah, are portrayed as what? Equals. John 14, verse 9, Jesus answered, Anyone who has seen me has seen him, the Father, and they will see his face. And this reminds me what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. And when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me, or at least most of us have. And for now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And it says his name will be on their foreheads, indicating that the almighty God himself has made them, has made us fully his own people. God's promise fulfilled. And then we got verse 5. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And this takes us back to the Old Testament, to um, to Daniel. Remember the importance of Daniel in understanding Revelation. Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. And then he reiter reiterates, Yes, forever and ever. And then he says in verse 27, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. The prophet Zechariah 
says in chapter 8, verse 8, I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. So amen and amen. And this concludes the vision of the new Jerusalem, um, the new heaven, the new earth, the bride of Christ, the tree of life, uh, the river of living water. And um, what can I say other than come Lord Jesus. Um, next week will be our last um, our last class, and it's every bit as exciting and important. So until then, um, amen, amen, and be blessed.